Today is May the 29th, 1993. It's now approximately 1.30. We're here with Regina Pierce, the mother of Pauline Grevier. And Leonard Pierce. And Leonard, and Leonard Pierce. Um, now, uh, Leonard is the professor? No. I'm sorry. No. He built this house. He was a builder, and now he's a photographer. <clears throat> the cousin, this is a cousin, mother's nephew. I see. No, oh. he's a writer. And he lives in Portland, Oregon. Okay. Is that Leonard? No. The Leonard professor. Leonard lives here. Okay. The professor. Sorry for the confusion, but we're here uh, as part of a continuing group of oral histories uh, taken for the American Jewish Committee. Um, uh, Ms. Pierce, do you understand that this tape um, may be used in the American Jewish Committee archives. Sure. And it, do you have any problem with its um, use by the American Jewish Committee for research or for publication or for use in its archives for any scholarly purpose or AJC purpose? Do I have any what? Uh, would it be? Would there be any problem with the American no. Jewish Committee making this available for oh, no. use in any form? Mm -hmm. See, I turned. Uh, see, I was very active in Brandeis, and uh, I turned over all the papers of Brandeis. I've got some now even to turn over. And I told them all of that at the time. No, I have nothing to hide. And you've been very active with the American Jewish Committee. Oh, yes. I was very active with that way back there when it first started in Dallas. Well, I hope we're going to get have time to talk about that also, but we've got a lot of ground to cover now. <laughs> And if, if you'll be good enough, I'd like to begin with the um, with describing all of uh, the people in your family as far back as family memory carries you. And I'm going to ask that y you go through the process of assembling those names however you want. Let's not be rigid. And I'll just mark them down on a page as we go through them, and then we can go back and cover them one by one. Well, uh, maybe with your extra questions when you said... Uh, go back as far as I can. You know, going back is very hard to remember names when I didn't know them. Well, maybe you heard from your grandparents about their no. parents. No. Then it's you just... See, m my father came from Berlin, and his mother lived to be 102. Okay, let's get those names. Your uh, father's name. Well, his name was David Salik Hart, H-A-R-T. From Berlin. Yeah. If it was any different there, and when he came over here, I don't know, because, you know, people change their names so much, because he went to live with an uncle who lived in Athens, Alabama, when he was 13 years old. Is, uh, it, is it possible that his name was Hertz? Maybe he translated it. Hurts. 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 It could have been. I don't know. Well, no. What was his mother's name? Hannah. And Hannah what? Do you know her maiden name? No. But H Hannah Hart, we assume. I guess so. Yeah. You know. Did you ever meet her? Yes. See, it goes back to uh, my father came to Athens, Alabama, where his uncle whose name was Lerman, last name was Lerman, and that family is all intermarried now that we have know nothing about any of them. Yeah. But anyway, uh, then my father was very active around there in, in uh, Tennessee and in Alabama and there. And I don't know, I think he was a grain dealer there and a lot of other things, but he got engaged to a girl by the name of Hattie Shlom. I remember that. Hattie? Hattie. H-A-T-T-I-E. Hattie Shlom. S-C-H-L-O-M. Okay. And they were to be married. And she died three weeks before they were to be married. So then he wandered away from then. I know he was at the in uh, in Leadville at the time of the silver rush there. And how he got to Bryan, I don't know. <coughs> Why? Never took it for granted. You know how you do when you're kids. You don't remember things. And he married my mother. Now she was a whole lot younger than I am than he was. 
and I was the... Was she, a, was she a Brian girl? Well, she was the one that was born in New Orleans. And she is, was the, well, it was, I guess it was their wedding. Yeah, that we had these papers on in 1865. Now, that was my mother's mother and father. Yeah, let's, what is your mother's name? Flora, Flora Wolf. <clears throat> and your mother's mother's name was what? I don't know, unless it's in that paper. Could be. <clears throat> I think it is. And this is not a regular ketubah. If you read it, it you see it's not because it says in there that the the bride and groom or the in it that the couple were to get eight thousand dollars in cash, which was a lot of money in those days. <laughs> but it says in there that the husband would have nothing to do with the spending of the money. It's in there. <laughs> hey, I'm going to read this quickly so we can understand yeah, the I contents. Don't. The said intended wife shall have the entire and free administration of her own property and the exclusive use of the revenues it may yield. The expenses of the said intended marriage and the maintenance and education of the children which may be born thereof shall be incurred and paid by the said intended husband out of his separate funds. The said intended wife possesses and will bring into the said intended marriage personal property to the amount in money and note of $8,000, the same having been acquired by her by donation from her cousin Max Pinsky. P I N S K I. That her, was a family name in in New Orleans. And her uncle Davis Wolf, W O O L F. That's David Wolf. Do you remember in Galveston, Pauline, you met him? As per the act of donation passed before but the. That must have been another David Wolf because, because that was my mother's age, and this is the marriage certificate of my mother's mother and father. Yeah, your grandfather. Yeah. This document was uh, executed, apparently an original, by uh, J-A-S period Graham, G-R-A-H-A-M, G-O period Senas, C-E-N-A-S, Rosalie Pinsky, R-O-S-A-L-I-E, P-I-N-S-K-I, and Andrew Hero, Jr. I don't know any of them. Notary Public. And they were filed for office in New Orleans, April 12th. 1881. What is that, 1881? Well, Isn't this dated 1865? Well, let's see what That's I... That's what I don't this understand. This may be a certified copy or it may be a different document. What I was reading from was a, uh, was a second page of a three-page document. I now am looking at the first page, styled State of Louisiana Parish and City of New Orleans. Be it known that on this 22nd day of June in the year of our Lord, 1867, and of the independence of the United States of America, the 91st. Before me, Andrew Hero, Jr., notary public, and for the parish of the city of New Orleans, in the presence of witnesses, states, Morris Wolf of this city, party here too, of the one part, and Miss Rosalie Pinsky, a minor, in her 21st year of her age, but duly emancipated by the decree of the Honorable, the Second District Court of New Orleans, rendered on the 18th day of June uh, of the same day, uh, a certified copy of which is annexed for reference to an act pa passed this day in this office, she being also a resident of the city, party here to the first part, which said Morris Wolf, W-O-O-L-F, and Rosalie Pinsky. That was my grandfather, that was my mother's father, was Morris Pinsky. Declared that in view of the marriage, which is about to be solemnized between them, they had contracted and agreed, and do by these presents mutually contract and agree upon the stipulations and conditions, etc., um, <coughs> that the said intended husband and wife shall be separated in property, and to this end and purpose they hereby formally renounce the disposition of the civil code of the state establishing a community of uh, <coughs> aquets, I suppose that means assets, and gains between husbands and wife as between those of all similar laws in all other places which the said husband and wife may hereinafter reside. And it goes on to further explain the terms for the separation of property. So what you have, what your, um, this is your grandparents? No, this is my, yeah, that was the wedding okay. of my 
grandfather and grandmother. On your mother's side? On my mother's. Oh, yes, this is all. This is all. <coughs> so, Flora Wolf's parents, <coughs> Rosalie Pinsky <coughs> and Morris Wolf. And that $8,000, which was a lot of money there, when you see, when he, he was, this Morris Wolf went to Pinsky. I'm get, I get so confused trying to think. When he, no, they, one of them, some of them, they went to England as a secretary of the commission for the Confederacy. He went there in order to try to get money for the Confederacy. But he had a shoe factory in New Orleans. And after the war, he had nothing. So they never had any of that $8,000. That must have been in Confederacy money. But that was, we're talking about 1867. Uh, so why would they talk about separate property? If, I don't know. How do you know as much as I do? Well, it's interesting because what you have here is a document <coughs> that's now very popular. It's a prenuptial agreement. <coughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they were way ahead of their time. You know, uh, at the time when was it Mark got married, Dad and I sat at a table was it, with was it Mark? I don't know. Somebody got married. I sat at the table with the relatives from New Orleans, and I told them about this stipulation and that. They said that has a lot to do with the laws in Louisiana at that time, and some to this day, that they acted more at that time under the laws of France instead of the United States. And France always took care of women more than any other country. Now, that's what I've been told. Well, we have the similar kinds of laws here in Texas. They're community property laws, and they uh, provide for community property. And they didn't, and so they did not want to have their, that property shared between the husband and the wife mm -hmm. at the beginning of the marriage. Yeah. That's interesting, isn't it? I think it is. Now let's, uh, you, as far back as we've gone, um, now we have Rosalie Pinks, Pinsky <coughs> and <coughs> Morris Wolf, and on the other side at that level we have Hannah Hart, but we don't know Hannah, that is your father's mother's husband's name. Yes. His name was Joseph, I think. I think it was Joseph. You know, I left their pictures when we moved from Forest Avenue. I had them framed and didn't bring them with me. I don't know why. They were in Berlin. Well, she wore a shadow. My grandmother wore a shadow. Uh, meaning Hannah? Uh-huh. But my aunt, you'll see later on that my aunt, my father's sister, raised my uh, my uh, sister and me. She was one of the first Jewish women in Germany to become a Reformed Jewish. Now, we're talking about Selig Hart's uh, sister. Yes. And what is? Well, she was Frieda. Frieda. Uh, well. She ended up being Frieda Kaiser, but in Germany she was Frieda Grossberg because she had been married to a doctor there who died. And that's when she came back. But that's a story in itself, too. Okay. Do, um, I, do you know if Joseph or Hannah had any other siblings? Yeah. Uh, George and Hannah. They had a daughter named Rosie. Well, that was her first name, Rosie Rutkowski, and they're the ones that changed their name to Rutland here. Okay, so uh, you, no, you're talking about another, uh, my, what, David? My father had two sisters. Okay, that's Rosie and Frida. And Flora. Not Rosie Frida? And Frida, yeah. Okay. And, and the, Rosie's name was what? Rosie Rutkowski. Do you, he, do you know how to spell that? 
R-U-T, I think I'll find out because Jane can give me that, Jane Ray. That's a distant relative in there. Uh, but the name was changed to Rutland after it came to the United States. But Rakowski was a rabbi in Liverpool, England for 25 years. Rosie's husband? Uh-huh. What was his name? Rakowski. Uh, his first name? No, I've forgotten it. I, it'll come to me after a while. It's been so long since I even... Uncle. I'll ask Jane. I'll call you and give you that. That's that's very interesting. Did you ever meet him? I think I met him when my sister and I were living in Berlin for a year and a half. But in 1910, Auntie and Papa and Rosie and I f sailed from Galveston to New York. And in New York, we were to take a boat to Liverpool, England. And we were met in New York by Judas and his brother Bert with the news that his name was Rudolf Berkowski, that Uncle Rudolf had died. So we never saw him after that. So Rudolph was the rabbi yes. from Liverpool. Mm -hmm. Do you know where he was born? No. No. All right, so we're, we're, making, we're making a lot of progress here. So we already know about Joseph and Hannah. We know they have three children, David Seligart, your, pet, your father, Frieda Grossberg, and Rosie Rudkowski Rutland, whose husband was a rabbi. Frieda Grossberg, uh, um, um, Kaiser, because that's what everybody knew in Dallas. K A C Z E R. She had remarried. K A C Z E R. Auntie was well known to among. We had very few Jewish people in comparison to now, but she, she was a wonderful person. Do you do you have any idea when uh, jo Joseph and Hannah were born? No. Well, you did say something. Didn't you tell me that your... Oh, that's on your mother's side. That was, yeah. on whose side was somebody, the, one of the first Reformed Jews? That's Frieda Kaiser. Frieda was one of the first? Mm -hmm. in, are you talking about America or in Germany? In Germany, where the rigid, you know, Reformed Judaism originated in Germany. I don't know if you know that. Yeah. Um, I do, and I'd be. Uh, do you know what city it is that Frida uh, was raised in in Germany? No, I don't. It might have been Berlin. I just don't know. I, I was about four years old at the time. <laughs> can you give me an idea when that was? Four years old. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm ninety-four right now, so that's ninety years. Is ago. that right? You didn't know that. No. I'll be ninety-five in October, honey. <laughs> Your mother knows it. That's wonderful. <laughs> Well, you know what it just happened to me, don't you? Yes. But you look very well now. I feel fine. Thank it's God. A, I'm a mystery. I returned from the dead. A good friend of mine called me up and says, Hello, angel. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest of them called me their miracle. Because really, they thought I was gone. The doctors thought I was gone. But how do you feel right now? I'm fine. Are you happy? I'm happy, very happy. I always am. I, I always have been a Pollyanna all my life. That's why you and my mother get along. Oh, yes. <laughs> she is terrific. She doesn't let anything get her down, does she? Nothing. Nothing. Well, <clears throat> we, have, we have Joseph and Hanno. Do we have any idea where they were born? You know, nobody even thought of taking notes. You just take it. I'm, I was talking yesterday to a friend of mine here who is from Louisiana or somewhere, and she's in the same position I am. She never thought to ask any questions. Okay. Well, we're, you know, sooner or later, everybody. That's Jane Ray on the phone. Is there a name that you wanted from her? Yeah. Uh, just now, we Pauline just found out that... Um, I thought it was a rabbi. Uh, Rudkowski 
was, in America was known as Rutland, uh, turned out not to be a rabbi. He turned out to be a cantor. Okay. And two, his first name was not Rudolph, it was Adolf. Well, I'll, yeah, that Uncle Adolf now become a name for Rosie. Okay. Now, you also told me that Rosie died in childbirth with her sixth, sixth child, child, and that um, he remarried. He married a murder, uh, evil stepmother. Do you know her name? No. Good, we don't I, want to slander I never her. Met her. <laughs> I never met her, and, uh, and also, and what I heard about it was from my aunt. Who grew Frida, up with her. Frida, who, yes, and no, who used to leave Berlin and go over to Liverpool and wash these children's clothes once or twice a year and fed them food and, and everything else. And so as a result, I think of the six children, they all left home as soon as they possible. And here was, came from a really religious family, three of them married Catholics, way back then. And this was all, they stayed in uh, Germany? No, they all were in, that's a rabbi. Excuse me, they, they stayed Liverpool, in Liverpool? Liverpool. And then most of them came to the United States. Do you know when? No. No. Do you think it would it that was, be uh, closer to, do you think it would be before the Civil War or after? I, I imagine after. Yeah, I'm sure it was afterwards. Do you know what kind of uh, businesses they they got into? Well, I know that Julius. I don't know what he was in, because he was. Who was Julius? Two, that's the son. This, yeah, one of the sons of the rabbi. Okay. I the can know. the cantor. Of the cantor son, and the other son was a top 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 salesman in New York for some men's supply thing, and he was a real good friend of all of the big shots that started television. What was his name? Radio, probably. Huh? Radio, probably. No. Television. I mean, I mean, movies of the big movie people. Those were his friends. Do you remember his name? Uh, Bert Rutland. Bert, R-U-T-L-A-N-D. I've never even told Pauline these things. Uh. <laughs> now, what you may want to know is that Julius Rutland's daughter was here. Who's that? Her name is Jane Gray. And that's who you just talked to? Yeah. Jane Gray. She's probably a trouble in history. She seems to have kept up. I think she has. Yes, because of all that. You see, she, Julius lived with her and they She knew him all her life. I thought Julius was too young. And then her mother, I was telling her about her uncle, was John Rosen. You ought to be able to get some. That's, that'd be a treasure trove. Now, this is Jane's uncle? or Yes. That means there was another brother, another son of Adolf. Well, that's on the other side. Of the on the mother's family. side that's of the, the family. Side. So that's something else. That has nothing to do with what you're trying to find out from me. No, if it's it's interesting. Get it from her. <laughs> it, it, but we're, we're mapping out the, mm -hmm. the territory. Mm -hmm. And uh, then when you get through with that, she's married to a man named Ray, who was a Rachofsky, and that's a big old family here in Dallas, too. There's a sculptor in, in the city named Rachofsky. That's right. That's Mort. Yeah, Mark Rachofsky. That's all a tremendous family here. Okay, but that's the maternal, um, or Rutkowski, the maternal side of one of the Rutkowski children's wives. No, that's a pret No, no. Mother brought in a red herring for you. The <laughs> Rachovskis are Jane's husband's side of the I said, I that's Sorry, another that's thing. A, that's a red herring. Don't I'm yeah. getting him all confused. Yeah, you better be careful. That's why I have to take notes, because you see, you know all this, but I don't. Are I you going to do all sorts of cutting on and editing on this? Probably not. I mean, eventually, yes, but right now, no. I will. Um, I believe when he's through with me, he's going to have a lot of leads to talk to. That's right. <laughs> now, uh, Frida Grossberg Kayser, um, do you, do you want to mention any of her kids? She never had any. I see. We were my sister. See, I had a sister. Well, let's not talk about the sisters now, but Frida Grossberg Kayser had no children. Uh, do you know when she died? Yes, she died when Pauline was just a 
before Pauline was eight years old, so you trace it, you trace it back. That's 50 years ago. Actually, um, she actually became mother's mother. She literally moved into the home and raised them. Right. Uh, yeah, we never knew our mother at all. Auntie was, she was known as Auntie, Frida Kaiser, and she's buried here in Dallas, and so is my father. And Tanta, she's Tanta. Tanta. Um, and da David Salicar, do you know, um, do you remember when he died? Your father? He died, uh, God, before yeah, then. four years ago. It, just a few years before. I could go to the cemetery and look on the tombstone. He's in what cemetery is he in? Here in Dallas. Which one? Temple Emmanuel. Our both, both of them are Temple of. Frida and your father. Mm -hmm. um, are, are any of the Rutkowski Rutland? Judas Rutland is buried here. In, in the Emmanuel Cemetery? Mm -hmm. Now. Um, we said that we didn't know any um, brothers or sisters for Joseph and Hannah. Is that right? That's your grandparents. Okay. Now let's, and we're going to come back and we're going to talk about growing up, but first I want to talk about the Wolf family, because there's some very interesting stories yeah, about the I Wolf. Know. Oh yeah, about that. That is my claim to fame. No, you've got a lot of claims. No, That's that just one. is, when people start bragging about their ancestors, I say to them, I listen to them, I say, well, I've got one claim to fame. I, what is that? I have a great-great-uncle who was a pirate with Jimmy LaFitte. So that's really a claim to fame, isn't it? Now, that, it's funny that you didn't say who died in the Alamo. No, I, I tell them that later on. I tell them <laughs> she that. She has this And when they, when I've told it so many times and everybody is so interested. Well, why don't you tell the story? How do you, tell, tell us right now how you tell your friends. Well, the way I tell it was if they're bragging and I'm going to brag, so I said, well, I have one claim to fame. What is it? I have a great, great uncle somewhere along the line who was a pirate with Jean LeFitte. What? They'll say. And when the pirates were chased out of New Orleans, they went to the Isle of Galveston. And they were there when the call came for volunteers to come to the Alamo. And to the Alamo came a lot of people, among them many scalawags. And he w was one of those that went there. And he was killed at the Alamo, and his name is on the walls of the Alamo. That's it. And his name is? Well, you tell it. No. Wolf. Wolf. It was his first name Avram? They have it printed down there as Anthony, I believe. See, and all of this is hearsay. Nothing is written. When my mother died, my I was about maybe going on anyways between four and five years of age. And then I had a sister 17 months younger, and then I had this younger brother. Well, it's hard for me to, and we, we have no, not the only thing that I have from my mother's family at all is this level. The rest of the stuff, the family in Houston got it, you know, the Gorginsky family. I don't see them, so I can't give you any details about them. <laughs> what is the relationship of Morris Wolf to um, Anthony or Avram Wolf? Well, I, uh, all I know is a great great uncle somewhere is way back there. That's all I know. Um, I want to mention for anybody who reviews this that um, a discussion of this material appears in Pioneer Jewish Texans by Natalie Ornish yeah, in Appendix E at page 278. And one of the things discussed is um, the, the Hart family. That's, that was my father. Alexander Hart? No. That was David Salick Hart. Do you, uh, are you familiar that. with a Jacob Hart no. or an Alexander Hart? No. They were an 18th century, um, they were both born in the 18th century, and they 
found their way to New Orleans by around 1805. Well, that's that must that must I don't I really don't know. See, that was that hot you said? Yes. Well, no, that would be my father's son. While everything else that I give you in regard to uh, Louisiana is on my mother's side. So my father's is all German that came from Germany. Well, what Natalie says in her book is that Jacob Hart's younger brother, David Hart, of New Orleans, may have been an ancestor of she David. She says may have been, you see. Right. And if it was, I know nothing. I have never, I know nothing about that. Okay. In any case, the Hart family has nothing to do with the Wolf family. and uh, Except that when my father married, when David Wolf married Flora Hart, I mean, uh, David Hart married Flora Wolf. That was my mother and father. Well, so nothing came, nothing other than uh, the marriage agreement of your grandparents on your mother's side came to you, um, and we don't know exactly the relationship of Morris Wolf to Anthony or Avram Wolf, do we? We don't know whether we don't know how far that goes back. As I said, I don't know because nothing was ever written. All I know that I would hear stories as a child. It seems that to me it was, could be a, a, a granduncle or an uncle. Yeah. Somewhere in then we'd have to kind of see about the dates as to whether when something in New Orleans, whenever it was, the date of the Alamo and the date that we have on here. Uh, did, you, did you ever hear anything specific about how he became uh, a pirate? Or what made them come to Texas? No, nothing. Yeah, he came to Texas with the pirate from New Orleans to Galveston. Just to hide out. Mm -hmm. But you don't know anything I more about that. Nothing. Who in your family told you the stories? I don't know. You like just heard know. them? You, huh? you just happened to hear I the stories? I just heard them talking. You knew about a lot from Uncle Dave in Galveston. Yeah, but I don't remember much of it. And you know, the one who really knew things was Phil. Because you know, Phil Grogan. Grogan. Mm -hmm. But uh, I guess that they had they had some papers because it was Phil's sister-in-law, Sonia, who gave this to me. That's how I came in possession of it. This is a family from who was in Houston, mm -hmm. and one of the brothers, whose mother's cousin lived in Fort Worth, so they were very close. Groginski? Groginski. None of them live there anymore. And they, they live in Houston, some of the grandchildren, the and they've all changed their name to Grogan. No, yeah, all of them, because Phil Groginski was, had something to do with the East Texas oil fields being, he was a geologist, but his children all changed their names, so I know nothing about them. His siblings changed their names. Oh. His brothers and sister changed their names. Oh, Field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ross Grogan, Phil, and Judith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now what, what I want to do is go uh, through each of the people that we've mentioned and collect whatever um, general facts you have about them. Uh, you never knew Joseph, your grandfather, on your father's side. You did know Hannah Hart, is that right? Your grandmother? No. You never met her? Not that I remember. And they, and both of them were German, is that correct? No, who, again. Uh, Joseph and Hannah Hart. No, they came originally some ways in England to, before they came to the United States. But I don't know where they come from before that. I know that. So that's how that the this one, that uh, Joseph. Oh, uh, well, I don't know whether he was born in England, but he lived in England, and he shipped out of Liverpool at, with a vaudeville company and as a dancer, and oh. Uh, went with this vaudeville troupe from Liverpool over to New York. Do you know the name of the troupe? No. Did you ever hear any stories about what kind of act he had? 
do you know yes. if it ha had anything to do? Was it a Jewish troop? No, I don't know. I don't. He stored above it illegitimately so as to get out of England. That's all I know. He stole you, away. Uh, that's what I was told. I got this from my mother's sister, Hannah. Now, who are we talking about? I'm a her grand, her mother's father. Your mother's father. Excuse me, uh, I'm sorry, her father's father, Joseph. David Hart's father, Joseph. Oh, no, no. no. That was anything Germany, not from England. I think you know. better switch back. I think you better. Okay, I, back. I've lost. I think so too. Lost. I think it's so off that I can't give you. Who was the? Who was? Uh, who was it that stowed away from England? That was my mother's mother's father or grandfather. I don't know which it was. Okay, your it? your mother uh, is Flory Flora. Wolf. She was. Uh, and your mother's mother. My mother was Flora Pincus and became Pinsky. Flora Pinsky and became Flora Hart. See, what's confusing is we're switching back and forth yeah. about the families. Too much. Right. Well, w let me tell you what I have written down. I have that your, your mother's name um, was Flora Wolf Hart. Right. Your mother's mother was a Pinsky. Uh -huh. Rosalie Pinsky. Right. And that's what we, we saw yeah. when we read the marriage that's document. Right. <laughs> and what you were telling me is that on in Rosalie Pinsky's family, um, somebody came from England? Yeah. It was either, I don't know whether it was her father or grandfather. Somebody did, and that's how that branch of the family came to the United States. And where did they wind up? In New Orleans? I guess so. That's a all I know about them, they were there. And I asked people from New Orleans if there was a Pinsky family, but I thought that you said that the relative who went to plead the funds from the Confederacy was from another southern state, no, not no. Louisiana. No, no, he's the one that was from New Orleans. Okay. He's the one that was from New Orleans. Was that a Pinsky or a Wolf? That was a wolf. Okay. Now, then we go to Morris Wolf's uh, side of the family. Do you know any of Morris's brothers? Do you know anything about his parents or grandparents? Years ago, there was somebody in the Wolf family living here in Dallas, but I never met the Wolf. <laughs> I met his wife years ago, and then in she just disappeared. She was not Jewish and never became Jewish. And, and what about Uncle Dave? How was he related? I was my mother's brother. And he so lived in Flora Galveston. Flora had a brother named Dave. Hmm. And he lived in Galveston. And that's an old, old family. He married into two old, old families there. But I don't know anything about it. You mean he married twice? Um, can we assume that Rosalie Pinsky uh, was born or grew up in New Orleans? That was my grandmother, yeah. Yes, she did. Okay, and uh, Morris Wolf the same? I don't know where he came from. In any case, we know they got married. We know they got married. We've got that too. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> they got married in New Orleans. Uh -huh. And then... When did, uh, where did Flory, uh, and where did uh, your mother and your father meet? I guess in Bryan, because yeah. that's where they lived. But they went to Galveston to get married, and they were married by, and I'm very proud of this, by Rabbi Henry Cohen. Did you ever hear of him? Yes, the very, very uh, famous rabbi. Oh, Galveston. there never was and never will be another rabbi like Rabbi Henry Cohen. What? See, he married my mother and father. He used to come and talk at Texas A&M. And I lived in Bryan, and A&M was five miles away. So whenever he spoke, I would get on the train in Bryan and ride five miles with Rabbi Cohen. And he would say, now what shall I talk about today? It's, this is in the book about him. And he would write his notes on his cuff. 
as to what he was going to talk that day, and that's what he talked on. And see, this man is somebody to be very proud of in Texas history. Of course, you were, have you read any of his books no. about him? The man who came to Texas. That's the famous biography. Do you know, was this about around World War One? Earlier, yes. Around that time. And so you you were still living at home then? I was living in Bryant. Yeah. Okay. Are there any specific lectures of his that you remember, or anything specific about his presence? No. You just liked him very much. I loved him. Was it because your parents loved him, or was it just no, something? No, it's because I loved him. See, we had 15 Jewish families that lived in Bryan, and we built a te little temple there. And the rabbis in Texas called the Dahl Temple, and the different rabbis would come. So I got to know Rabbi Henry Cohen, Rabbi Bernstein of Houston, Rabbi Faber of, of Tyler, and Dr. Greenberg, I think, right from Dallas. But he, Dr. Henry Cohen was the main one who would come there. And my sister and I were in, in the first confirmation class. And we were taught by somebody in, da in Brian, I've forgotten who it was. And then Rabbi Cohen confirmed us. And you see those Shasta daisies all across the front there? That's what we carried arm bouquets of Shasta daisies as our flowers. Not from a field, <coughs> but we cut them out of our front yard and carried them in at our confirmation. And what year was that? Well, we graduated from high school in 1917. So it must have been about 1914 or 15, somewhere like that. How did you tell Reed when your when your birth date is, though? We know, we know. He didn't know my age until I told him today. <laughs> let's um, let's talk about your memories of your parents. Um, I think I, I, I barely of my father, yes, but I, I I just barely remember my mother. Barely. How remember. how old was were you when she died? She, I must have, well. See, Rosie was a year and a half, 17 months younger than I was. And then there was another baby. So, you're probably four or five. Somewhere in there. But I never did tell you, Pauline, I was just telling him, that Papa apparently was on the outs with my mother's family. I don't know. And he had us living around, I don't know, with whom in Brian. But he had a Lady, a friend that he knew in Houston, because Papa, being a cotton buyer, would have connections back and forth between Brian and Houston all the time. And it was a Mrs. Johnson had a boarding house. And Papa took us there, and we lived at her house for at least a year before he took us to Berlin to be with Anki. And I was mentioning that of the people that came and boarded there were the early people in movies. I don't remember any of their names, but I can still see them in my mind's eye and hear them talking about that. And at that time, listen, they weren't considered anything when they went. An actor or actress, they were not nice people, according to people in those days. So that was in Berlin? No, this is in Houston. Ah. Let me read you what uh, Natalie Ornish writes about your father. Um, she quotes you saying that um, Flora Wolf, Mary David Hart, she says, she quotes you here, My mother was born in New Orleans circa 1870. My father came to America at age 13 to work for his uncle in Athens, Alabama, who had a great big old-fashioned general store and sold cotton material. And later on, my father became a cotton buyer in Bryan, Texas. Well, he didn't buy it. Did, she got that and, and, uh, uh, and sold cotton material. I don't know what he sold. As I said, he was at the Silver Rush in Liberal, Colorado. And he was somewhere else. And he was 
a gay debonairs was a time of Adelina Patty, and uh, he he drove a a he had a uh, what is it something up uh, had a horse and buggy with a what Surrey? Was, huh? a Surrey? Yeah. Uh huh. And uh, when he took when he took a date to hear Adelina Petter, he always sat in a box seat, never in anything else. And before the date, he would send her a half a dozen elbow-length white kid drums. This is your mother? That's my father. I mean, your father would send that to your mother? No, or to, to any somebody in, not before, that was before he came to Texas. <laughs> that was... So this is when uh, this uh, singer would come to New Orleans? No, or, no, excuse me, up Alabama. To somewhere in, in Tennessee and Alabama and all around there. He was a gay Lothario, a little bitty man. He was just about my size. But boy, as my aunt used to say, that he was little, but he was uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> and he came at the age of 13. Uh -huh. And you think that um, he came from Germany? Yes. And, you, and I don't know where he landed. But I, he did, did he come from Berlin? Yeah. And do you know what he was, what his family did in Berlin? Nothing about that. All uh, I know about my father's mother and father was that the mother, his mother, was the main stay of the family, and that he was a very learned man, and all he did was to pray and study all day. This is the father of Hannah Hart. And that was in Germany? That's all I know. You are bringing out things that I haven't thought about, I bet, in 50 years. <laughs> That's good, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Makes it fun. <laughs> it's fun for me. Is it? Yes. <laughs> now, for uh, uh, David Hart, this debonair uh, fellow David. who came to America at the age of 13 and who worked in and Athens, Alabama, and in Tennessee, and he was selling cotton cloth. No, not cloth. I or, don't know. Or, or some everything in the store. But he became what's called a cotton buyer in Bryan. That's where they bought the raw cotton in bales. And they didn't actually ship it, but they were the ones that bought it and sold it. And it was there's nothing like it in the business today at all. How, how old? Um, was he before he got into that end of the business? I don't know. I just know he was nearly 93 when he died. And when he died in the f 1950s? Whenever we... F it was oh, no, not 1950s. In the 19... Well, about 1939, I would oh, say. Oh, long before you. Yeah, Pauline had just... hadn't been... I was a little girl. Very little, because she was eight years... You must have been about four or five when he died. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. It's on the tombstone out here, so that's all. At Temple Emanuel. He, um, do you know when he moved to Bryan? No. But it, w it would have been sometime before the turn of the century, because you, you were born in I Bryan. I was born in 1898, honey. So, so it was before then that he came to Bryan. And we don't know whether your mother was actually living in Bryan. Oh, yes. She was. But you don't know how she got there. Well, her mother and father came there after the Civil War. But I don't know how or why or anything about it, except that when they left New Orleans, he had had a shoe factory. And when the war was over, he had nothing. But why he came to Bryan, I don't know. And there's nobody can I can ask. I don't know. I don't know a lot of people that I read in the obituaries now myself. Most of them are gone. Nearly everybody that I knew when I came to Dallas, they're all, everybody's gone. I am very fortunate that I have a lot of good friends like your mother. <laughs> yeah. Well, I said I was always a Pollyanna. He said that's why his mother and I get along so good. That's right. We're going now uh, into your growing up. Uh, if you can re remember anything about uh, the what your home looked like. And Where? Here or in Oh, in Bryan. Oh, it was a, we had a, 
We had a nine-room house all on one floor with five fireplaces and a tin roof over the back hall, which was a tremendous big back hall. We cooked with a wood stove. We had a well in the yard where we got our water. You didn't have indoor water? Oh, no, did not. Who ever heard of such a thing? They never even heard of such a thing. Uh, when we came to that. Yeah, we got it later on, but not when I was a little girl. See, I graduated from high school in Bryan before we came to Dallas. But, and we had, uh, and even when we came to Dallas, we used to uh, boil our clothes in the backyard, and they were all done. What year, did, what year did you leave uh, Brian and come to Dallas? In 1919. We came to Dallas in August of 1919. Well, let's talk, uh, all right, let's divide up the story into the Brian days and the Dallas days. Okay. And we'll start talking about the Brian days. Um, you you just described your home. What kind of... Now, that was a home in Bryan. Right. Now, the home here was at 2925 Forest Avenue, which now is across the street. It's not there anymore. It's across the street from the Martin, King. Martin Luther King. Martha Luther King. Center. Center. Oh, that's where... But it's that that's not on Forest anymore. Yes. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought they called it... So, uh, it's on Martin Luther King Boulevard. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and after they changed Forest to Martin Luther that's King, right, MLK yeah. Boulevard. Mm -hmm. oh. I see. Well, I know I know that area pretty well, and I I frankly remember, I think there's some um, small homes on the other side of the street. Oh, they are. There were very large homes on the other side. The one that Mother lived in was torn down, and a clinic was put up there, oh. a private clinic. That well, was right across the street there. But that's... I wish you would go back to when, when you were a little girl and include in there about when your mother died and then you went to the boarding house and then tell about going to Europe. Because oh. that's very interesting. Oh, yeah. When, after we went, and I was saying that when, when, uh, when we were at Mrs. Johnson in Houston, that's where the early movie people came. All right. Then Auntie's husband died. He was a doctor in Berlin. And he died, and Papa took us over there. And we lived with her and her mother, who lived to be 102, that I mentioned, you know. You didn't use names. When you said Auntie, you meant Tante Frida. That's, yeah, that's the same one, Tante. And you went with your father. Yeah, my father took my sister and me, and we took a ship from Galveston to Bremen, Germany, and then went to Berlin by train. When you were in Bremen, did, did you recall a lot of Jewish people trying? We just went through there. Well, I was wondering if, if you remember anything <coughs> about Egypt. Do you remember um, Jewish immigrants trying to come over to Texas, or do you see? No, no. I didn't even know anything. I was just four years old. Okay. <laughs> so then you, when you went to Berlin, you lived with Tonta and your grandmother. Yes, yes. Your grandmother, who she's already discussed. Yeah. And I remember that Crow's Garden, which was a big beer garden, and we used to go in the evening. They had a, an orchestra there in a, in a band shell. And I loved to dance, and I would get up there and dance the whole evening all by myself. When you were four or five. Uh -huh. And uh, somebody came along and said that I ought, to, I ought to study with, what was her name, a real famous dancer at that time, but I never did. And we lived in a, in a neighborhood called Punko, G-A-N-K-O-F-F. And I had a very unhappy experience during that time. I was a little black-headed gal, and my sister had golden hair and big blue eyes, and everybody talked how beautiful she was. And she looked like those old pictures of Cupid. So where we lived in Punko was a photographer, had his 
photography studio in the front, and he had glass windows where he put his prize pictures. And he asked to take my sister's picture, and he didn't ask to take mine. And it was put on there on display, and it was a great hurt, I can tell you. <laughs> Did it make problems between you and your sister? Well, I don't know. I guess we disagreed like all children do. Is your, what is your sister's name? Well, it was Rose Kind, Mrs. Ellick Stein, and she lived here. And she and her husband uh, both died in California. And they have a, that's the son who is the author of my aunt's, so, and then she had. That's, they have two sons. Mm -hmm one of whom is the historian that we mentioned to you earlier. And the other one is a doctor in California. But Mother, you had to have been more than four or five because you were four or five when your mother died. And then you went for a year. I over. didn't say I was four or five. I said, well, four or five when we got to Germany. Well, oh, no, you had we were year. there a year and a half. That's right, we were there. You had to be in, in Mrs. Johnson's boarding house before you went to Germany. Yes, we were. I don't know, Pauline. It, uh -huh. I, see, all of that, I just vaguely right. remember all of it. Now, when but I know when we got back to Bryan with Auntie, and we lived there, that I was old enough to go into school. But Rosie was not. And she could not talk any English, but I could. But she cried so much that they let her go into school at the same time I did. She only spoke German? Mm -hmm. And then she began to. Because, well, how much younger is she Rosie? She was 17 months younger than I was. It was very close then. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe five years old. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe you were about five mm -hmm. when it happened. And your mother may have died when you were maybe just turned four. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know I remember, I remember, I don't, I vaguely remember her, and I remember when the little boy died, because I remember there was a funeral at the house, and you know. So you had a brother that died. Well, that's at the childbirth, at, she died of childbirth. I see. Died of childbirth. They both died. And I know I remember that we had uh, like Cape Jasmine's blooming all around there, and for every funeral, the Cape Jasmine's were cut and put at the funeral, and I could never stand the odor of those or uh, what is gardenias. Uh, gardenias from that time on. No, the only reason I say that is that if you were that old when you died, when she died, then you went into Mrs. Johnson's. Oh no, we, I must have been. I don't know. I'm just trying to figure back. There was me, 17 months older, was Rosie, mm -hmm. and. And the little boy named Samuel must have been at least ten months mm -hmm. after that. Mm -hmm. So, I, okay. okay. So whatever. Whatever. Okay. Now, hadn't you gone to Europe at another time? Though? We we went in 1910. Oh, that was after Auntie was already yeah. living. Yeah, Auntie and Papa and Ro Rosie and I, and that's when we went from Galveston to New York, mm -hmm. and then went to New York, and then went to Liverpool when Uncle Adam. Was or had died just before we came. Tell about Auntie when she stepped off of the train in Bryan. Oh, she was, it was a cultured German woman. Let me tell you how cultured she was. She spoke English. She had come to this country when she was 16 years old to pay a visit to my father, who, as you know, was living here. And she stayed for a couple of years and went back to Germany, but she spoke English, French, and German. She made all of my sisters in my clothes, and when I say clothes, I mean she made our dresses, our underwear, our coats, our hats. She made it all. She was a fabulous cook. She also, she's the one that I said became the first, one of the first German women to become a reformed Jewess. When she would sew, she would have her book of Heine Agathe at her side, and would memorize all of that. So she was a very cultured woman. Here she comes from Berlin, which was a very civilized city. 
to Bryan. And we get off the train and it's pouring rain. There is there are no sidewalks. There are no concrete streets. My father, <laughs> we get off and he had hired a buggy and horse to take us to the house he had rented for us. But oh, and that I will never forget. That horrible looking place there. That's what Pauline wanted to tell. That's where we had well water. We had no sanitary things. But she had a beautiful house on it. And the day she died, Leonard was six, around 16. This is in Dallas. Though. In Dallas here, they taught philosophy the day she died. She was a very unusual woman. And I want to tell you something. I want you to know who takes after her. She is. Talk about the the life that you led in Bryan and the people who would come. Oh, yes. And the schools that were there yeah. and the Jewish culture that you had there. Well, we had, we had like, uh, um, what was what was it that used to, the Jewish people, because we had friends, we didn't have any Jewish, hardly any Jewish people. There was, there were no Jewish young men when we grew up, except at A&M and at Allen Academy, but not in Dallas. But, and we had friends, not only, my best friend was a girl named Hetty Edge, who was maid of honor at my wedding. She was a Methodist girl. but. Uh, Auntie, uh, what was it that used to always send lecturers around? B'nai B'rith? No, it was B'nai, before B'nai. Jewish Chautauqua? Chautauqua. To Chautauqua. Used to have people come, and whenever they, anybody came, they always were in our home. And we had, had a piano, and we had people in all the time, and we sat, sing and talk and schmooze and it was a very wonderful way to grow up. She had the Allen Academy young men and then the Texas A&M and then through World War One, where the, there was a uh, an army base. Oh yes, it was, the meteorologists were there and uh, and also that's when I got to know some Jewish fellows. What about the Taubman houses in? The well, the, Dr. Taubman House was uh, head of, of one of the big departments of the Extension Department. His at Texas A and M. His wife's sister married the um, um, rabbi of the Portuguese and Spanish. Uh, Synagogue in New York? Into New York. Sheriff Rabbi, Israel. Rabbi <coughs> DeSola Poole was his name. She married Rabbi DeSola Poole? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. One was of the, the most famous rabbis of the century. Yes, well, I knew him. How did you know him? Well, he came to Bryant, and he married uh, his... It was his brother-in-law. No, no, it was... Let's see, he married Mrs. Taubenhauer's sister, mm -hmm. and he was married to the, uh, DeSola Poole was married to this man, I've even forgotten his name, this Mary Kayser, he was married, he married Mary Kayser in Bryan, and he performed the wedding ceremony in Bryan. So uh, that must have been a relative of Frida's husband? No, no. No, no, this was We're just a friend. Just no a relative friend. of ours at all. There's a Dr. Taubin House and Mrs. Taubin House who every every young man who went to Texas A&M knew because she, she, was had the Jew she, was a head she was the head of the Jewish Welfare Board and of Hillel in at College Station. No relation of mine. Just friends. I thought you had mentioned a, a, a Kaiser. Well, that was Frieda Kaiser. That he performed the ceremony. Is that what you mean? Of the, okay. of the daughter of this man that Auntie married the second time. I see. Okay. He was a very interesting man, Dr. Well, DeSola Pula. Well, why don't you just say a few words? What do, you rem what do you remember about him? I don't know. I was in high 
high school at the time. But you, you liked him? Yeah, that was a long time ago, honey. Was he very young? Yeah, he hadn't been married very long. I don't think they'd had any children at the time. And uh, I met a, man, a rabbi here who is now, he came to lecture, lecture at the, uh, a Jewish community center who was the rabbi of that same synagogue. That's Mark Angel. Mm -hmm. I, I, but he didn't know him. I told him I knew to sell a pool. He wasn't very interested. <laughs> okay. But De Sola Poole wrote the Standard Orthodox Prayer Book um, that was in use in America from probably the 40s through the, until recently. And uh, even at Deferred Israel until recently you could still find the De Sola Poole Prayer Book. Um, he was a very influential man. Yes. Okay, very How interesting. How do you spell that? Um, S-O-L-A, two words, mm -hmm. um, and the pool. P-double-O-L-E? Yeah. He was, I don't know whether, the, were they Spanish or Portuguese, which one? Well, they were both, because the Spanish Jews uh, that left Spain in 1492, mm -hmm. most of them went to Portugal, which oh. did not have an inquisition then. Oh. And they were permitted to stay Jews for another five years. And then somebody sprinkled water all, on them all together and made them Christians immediately. Oh. These people later went to Northern Europe, places like Holland, um, mm -hmm. Antwerp, Hamburg. And these people are the ancestors uh, of the founders. That, well, they're, the, the, they're the ancestors of the founders of the Spanish Portuguese. They call them Spanish Portuguese because they were both. Yeah, See, that's from what Spain I to Portugal about. to Northern Europe. Well, now, those people that you had for the Jewish community, uh, when you had these people who gave that, were they offsprings of... That's right. Mm -hmm. They were. And you remember... I heard them twice. You know, you, you had them speaking twice. One time here at the Jewish Community Center, and then at somebody's house. American Jewish Committee. American Jewish Committee meeting. I heard them both. I'm glad you came. Yeah. It was very interesting to me. What else do you remember from Brian, Mother? You, you went to high school there. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I just went. Well, let's talk about, uh, you yeah, know, we need to talk about education. What kind of Jewish education did you have? No. There was no kind of uh, Sunday school or cheder? Well, we had no, no cheder. I had never heard a single uh, uh, gosh, I to me. we spoke German, but we did not speak Yiddish. Yiddish, as far when you say Yiddish word, my aunt blood would crawl, cause that was a bastard language as far as she was concerned. So we had and. We observed the holidays. We didn't have any temple. We didn't have any temple until the year before my sister and I were confirmed. About 1914. Mm -hmm. What? How would you celebrate the holidays? In our home. What Talk would you do? Nothing. Nothing. Would you do? Would you have a seder for Passover? Yes, we would have the seder, and uh, we knew when it was Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. But uh, as far as Hanukkah goes, we knew the story of Hanukkah. But whoever, when I came to Dallas, uh, Jonas, Janie's aunt was, that's how I got to start it, teaching Sunday school here at Temple Emmanuel. Was, and she taught the kindergarten and she got me to help her. And they told about the Hanukkah bush. Whoever heard of Hanukkah bush before then? Nobody. Nobody nobody celebrated. Nobody exchanged gifts at Hanukkah. That's all a recent thing. When did you exchange gifts? Uh, uh, Hanukkah? No, when? At what time of year? Did you Oh on birthdays. And that was all? Uh -huh. No uh, Christmas. No. Oh, oh. <laughs> no. Uh we did around that time because when we went to school in Bryant, Rosie and I hated 
when Christmas came because we did not celebrate Christmas. We didn't, and of course, nobody celebrated Hanukkah. And we did not celebrate Christmas. But, oh, and, yeah, and I found that same thing to happen when I taught Sunday school, that Hanukkah and Christmas came at the same time, about the same time. And children in my class in the third and fourth grade, they tell me the gifts they got for Hanukkah, and then they tell me the same gifts they got for Christmas. So I never knew a lot of those children here in Dallas whether they celebrated Christmas or Hanukkah. That's what it used to be. So it was very different in Bryan. Oh, no, we didn't celebrate it at all. What about the other Jewish people in Bryan? I don't know what they did. I know one holiday we was is it Purim where you have the grapes and all? Uh, no, grapes? what is it? That's Hanukkah. No, no, it's no, no, no. Sukkot. No, hold, hold it. When you say grapes, you mean the baskets of fruit? No, I'm talking about when now. Now it's basket of fruit. But in Bryan, my aunt Hannah had they had a, an arbor with a lot of grapes growing. It was. And, and you used to eat a meal out there? Yeah. How about that? Mm -hmm. So and you, 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 and tell me what you would do out there. What do you remember? What aunt? Well, uh, uh, my mother had a sister, Aunt Hannah. And that was uh, Julius and Philip's mother. And, they, and she lived in Bryan? Uh -huh. Your mother, Flory had a sister named Hannah. Flora. Flora. No, my mother was Flora, and her sister was Hannah. Oh, I didn't realize. And Uncle Dave. But you see, something happened, and Papa had nothing to do with any of them. That's why I know nothing hardly about my mother's family. So they had a blow-up, but they both lived in Bryan. Oh. But, but Dave lived in Gallus. After Hannah died, he then moved to Galveston. No, he lived in Galveston all of, for years and years and years before Hannah died. He never lived in Bryan that I knew. He always lived in Galveston. Well, where did you go to the Grape Arbor? In Bryan, Hannah. Hannah Groginski. You know, I told you that. They had the Grape Arbor at their house. So you're bringing up things that I haven't thought about in so good. many years. It's good. <laughs> now we won't forget. Hannah Groginski. And uh, would you say prayers when you would uh, sit under the grape arbor? No. You would just eat a meal? I guess there. so. But we went to temple every Friday night. And we each had, each family had their own pew. And in Bryan? In Bryan. When we built a little temple there where all the rabbis would come and visit. What year was that? Oh. You said it was the year before you were confirmed. Confirmed. Yeah, a year or two before. It was called Temple Frida, and I think I think that temple is still standing. Temple what? Frida. Temple Frida? Uh -huh. I don't know who it was named for. Like your auntie's name? Mm -hmm. But it was not named for her, so I can't bring that in. Let me stop just for a moment. We're looking now at a picture of Bryan, Texas, taken in the 1860s. And, Regina, you said that this I wasn't is... There in oh, I know that, but you said <laughs> it looked something like that yeah, when you I were did. a girl. There's, there were wagons, and that's what it looked like here in Dallas, too. A lot when we came here. Tell about when you got electricity there. In Bryan? Mm -hmm. Yeah. My father and aunt had bought, I was working at A&M College, and I got off of the, but off of the streetcar. It was not the streetcar named Desire. It was a streetcar, though, that <laughs> we rode. And I got off of it, and then I'd always stop at the drugstore Mr. James had, and had a, ice cream soda or malted milk. I don't know how I ate them. I probably didn't. And then I was walking home, and I was a block from home, and I looked up, and the whole house is lighted up, 
We had just gotten the electricity, and that was the most exciting thing I think that nearly ever happened. Imagine that you could just punch something and get light, because we used to have to clean the oil lamps every day. That was it. It was a joyful occasion. I told, so the reason I told Pauline about it. When did you get indoor plumbing? I'm trying to think when did we get I must have been in I must have been in grade school when we got indoor plumbing. But we were very elegant. We had a double outdoor toilet. And we used, you know, you didn't have toilet paper at that time. You know what everybody used? Sears catalog. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> was your house a Sears house? Was it one of those Sears um, prefabricated homes? Oh, no. Oh, no. We rented a house, and then that was what I told you. They, my father and aunt bought that 11-room house all on one floor, mm -hmm. and we had... Uh, seven fireplaces, and we had four porches around the house. Oh, it was wonderful. I thought you said five fireplaces. Maybe it was five. I know there was so many fireplaces, but we also cooked with, with wood, and later on with coal. And we had to heat all the dishwasher, to wash dishes in a kettle on the stove. How much German uh, did you use in your family? And entirely at home. After, until World War I, we sp not only did we speak German, but we wrote and read in the German script. But, goodness, we didn't dare speak a word of when in World War I away from home. And here we were very careful during World War II, too. To uh, speak German. Not, not to speak German. Not uh, to to speak it. Not to, didn't want to. Right. Do, do you still speak German? I can. I have not talked it in so long that I wish I wish I could remember. And when I listen to it on television, it's very garbled. I know some words and I can understand. But the accents and the different communities, see if there was a Plattdeutsch, which is low German, and then there's a Hochdeutsch, and I spoke Hochdeutsch. We didn't talk Plattdeutsch. My aunt was a little, uh, she, was, she was a very elegant, cultured person, you know, and uh, she was lovely to everybody, because she thought, because it used to be that the German people didn't think that the uh, Polish people were as upper class as they were, but Auntie was friends with all of them that she came in contact with, and she thought the Polish women were the most beautiful of all the women in Europe that she knew. But there were certain things she just didn't believe in, like, like Yiddish. <laughs> What else do you want to know? Well, what uh, did uh, your, uh, was your aunt uh, a religious person? No. What about your father? No. Was anybody in your family, in your immediate family? They were religious. Well, I guess the one that was the uh, cantor was, but I didn't know him very much. No, I never, I never. And I don't know if you know it. But when we came to Dallas, or did I mention the difference between Reform and Orthodox in Dallas was terrible. Mm, we're going to come to that in just a moment. That was did you Did you not have any Orthodox um, people in Bryan? Not that I know of. I had never heard a word of Yiddish until I came to Dallas. How many, how many Jewish people do you think lived in Bryan? Fifteen families. That was the total, as long as you lived there. And how, how did they, everyone get along with their Gentile neighbors? All right. No problems? Not that I know of. Did you ever um, have, did you ever know what an 
anti-Semitism was? Hardly. Hardly. So people were fairly tolerant. What do you remember about black people? I was going to say, uh, I know the conditions that the black people lived in. I know how terrible it was and what it is today. And when I think back about what it was then and what it is today, the black people, I don't blame the black people for resenting. But, you know, you can't change people overnight. And what has transpired from the time that I was a child until now is phenomenal. In what way? In where? We lived in our lovely house in back of what was a big open field. And there was a little shanty there. One room, no bathroom. A mother and father and four children lived in that one room. And even when we came to Dallas, Hardly black people had anything at all. They, they were so happy to get anybody's cast off clothes. So I think what has happened to the black people is wonderful. Did your father do business with black people? Oh, and they loved him. Now, when my, I told you where my father was raised, and the people in Alabama did not consider black people human beings. But he was always very good to them. And as a cotton buyer, he had porters that worked with him. And all of them loved Mr. Hart because he was always kind to them and treated them like human beings. And that's how we were raised, to treat them as human beings. And that's how we raised our children, too. Now, Pauline and Leonard, my son, always treat a black person person with extreme courtesy, and they always have, but most people did not do it. And did that, did that make you upset when you would see that when you were a child? I didn't like it. But you know, and when you're a child, you don't notice those things. Now Pauline's little grandson, who we think is a very precocious child, well, his, one of his best friends in Canada is a little black boy, isn't it? And he doesn't know the difference at all. And uh, so as a child, you don't notice those things, you know. Did you play with black children? No. They didn't come around where we were. They were certainly not in the schools. I don't know if they even went to school. Oh, it was, it was bad. And it's bad bad today too, but it's heaven compared to what they used to have. What about um, uh, Mexican people? I didn't know any until I came to Dallas. Did you ever see any in Bryan? Oh yes, uh, there was a Mexican man that sold tamales on the street, on the downtown street corners, and we used to go and buy tamales and he'd wrap them up in a newspaper and we'd take them home. That was my that's what I knew about Mexican people then. Did, did you ever, uh, did people have bad feelings towards Mexican people and Brian? Was there any kind of prejudice about? I don't know. Is it they, now, now the Labellos, they were Italian, weren't they? The Italian Labello family here in Dallas, Martini, those are all Italian, aren't they? Are you talking about Bilo? Huh? The, the Bilo family? No, Labello. That was a LaBello family in Bryan, and then they were here in Dallas. Well, Martinez, isn't that a Martinez Mart is, uh, is Spanish, though. They're, they're Hispanic. Well, then these people, some of them, they had a, we had, Bryan was laid out the business district, and then it was uh, Lower Bryan, where this one, I don't know whether it was Mexican or it was Italian, had a little store, and he had six that was strung up on a string hanging down in his store. And we'd go down as a special treat. And all the candy was in the counter. You know, nothing was wrapped in paper or anything, so that was dished out to us. And that's, that's the extent of the Italian and Mexican people that I knew in Brian. What was your favorite kind of music in Brian? Oh, well, of 
the piano, violin. Any songs? Oh, yeah, we knew all the songs then. I don't remember what they were anymore. America, Star Spangled Banner, dance music, love dancing. Yeah, are there any teachers that you recall that you liked or you really yes, didn't I like? Yes, I remember uh, a Miss Ray. Uh, she taught me in the fourth or fifth grade. And I was a very, supposed to be a very sensitive child, and I would sometimes have a chip on my shoulder. And she got me one day after class, and she said, I want to talk to you, and I can remember that so distinctly. She said, you know, you're a smart little girl, and you have a lot of nice things to do for you, but you've got to stop being so sensitive. And that's what changed me to being a Pollyanna. So I do remember her. Ray Montgomery was her name. Miss Ray Montgomery. And what, te what did she teach you? Well, they taught a whole, cl a whole room full. What they, age were you? I think I was about the fourth grade at school. Ten or eleven years, something like that. Six and around. Yeah. At, at school, um, did, did you do... Uh, in, did you sing Christian songs and did you celebrate yeah, Christian holidays? Yes, and yes. Well, d you did. I know Leonard also had it here, where they had the Christmas tree in the room, and we just sang all the Christmas songs. Well, did anybody say? Did everybody know that you were Jewish? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they just expected you to join along. Oh yes. And your your father and Aunt Frida didn't care. No. And I never. It never worried me. It never worried me but my children. Uh, the reason I remember it so distinctly is my son. I didn't know he had all these allergies, but he'd go at Christmas time and they had these live cedar trees, and he'd be deathly sick after that. And to this day, he has terrible allergies, and that's what it was at that time. And they sang all the Christmas songs. And I don't know, we had prayer in the school. We didn't think it, it didn't affect us. I know there's all that's what's going on now about yes in the school or not in the school. It never bothered us. Pauline, right. you want to switch over to Dallas now? Is there, do we? Yeah, I can't think of anything else. All right, so you came to Dallas. What? You were already a grown woman. Yeah, I was out of high school. And after? Had you been working in Bryan? Yeah, I worked at Texas A&M College in Bryan. Uh, worked first at the extension department where Dr. Tabenhouse was the head of it. And I also worked at the architectural department at Texas A&M. What did you do? I was a stenographer. I was one of the first in Dallas. I'll tell you something you want to know about something about me. I was the first girl in Dallas to bob her hair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what year was that? Well, it was right after I got out of high school. That was in 19, about 1918. That's before you came to Dallas. Yeah. You were the first girl in Bryan. In Bryan, yeah, to bob my hair. What made you all move to Dallas? Auntie Mary Kayser. And they, she thought we would be better off living here. And he opened a shoe factory and went Mahola. That's a Jewish word I know. <laughs> that's the first Yiddish. Now that's the second Yiddish expression. You said schmooze earlier. Schmooze. Yeah. You said, and now yeah. you said mechula. So you know, I never understood any Yiddish word until Pauline married Lenny Gruvier, and his family were conservative, but they spoke Yiddish. So to this day, if I want to know something, I ask her. Not me, ask Lenny. Yeah, no, but you know much more than I do, because they taught it to you. You lived in Chicago all those years. Just a little bit. Yeah, but at least it was more than I know. Yeah. So you came to Dallas, and did you all live together? Mm -hmm. Auntie and her husband, and they got a divorce after a while, and he left here. And Papa and Rosie and I, and we were both married at our home on, on uh, Forest. Forest Avenue. But that didn't come till much later. Oh, yeah. Uh, I know. But what I'm talking about, we had lived there 
from 1909 until we got. 1919, and Dad and I married in 1925, and Rosie married earlier, so. Were, were your parents, was your father well to do by this time? He, he, he was a cotton buyer, and he made three fortunes and lost them all in the cotton business. <laughs> that was typical of the cotton business. It was very speculative. Very, very. In those days, did people actually go out to the cotton markets, buy the cotton, and take care of delivering it, or did they buy contracts? They bought, they bought cotton samples. They went, the cotton samples were in, like the cotton, and it was wrapped. So it was about this big around and about this, looked like a pillow that had been wrapped. And they had these samples, and it was middling and high grade and all of that stuff and they would buy it according to that. And I know my sister and I used to write up those cotton uh, contracts, and that you never saw it. But we used to see it because they'd be on the cotton compresses. And when we went to school in Bryan, from the first sixth grade, it was on the west side of Bryan. And when it came after the sixth grade, we went to the east side, and we had to cross a cotton compress and uh, a train that ran through the middle of the town in order to get to school. Is this Bryan Street, downtown Dallas? No. Oh, you're talking about Bryan, Bryan, back there. I'm going back to... to but now, what was this about? After uh, after he came to Dallas, he opened up a shoe factory? No, that was my, my aunt, Frida Kaiser. Her husband opened a shoe factory here, but it was... He had a lot of money, but he... And they divorced, and he moved away, out of the life. And it was his daughter who married Mrs. DeSola Brood, uh, DeSola Brood's brother. Not that you need to write any of that up, I'm just for your own information. Mother, what did you do when you moved here? What did, what did Papa do? What did he Andy didn't do, do anything. <coughs> he didn't do anything. He couldn't. It was pretty rough, but he was a very sturdy man. At the age of 90, he used to walk from Bryan down to the First National Bank on Commerce Street downtown and back on the same day. From Forest? Yeah. That's a long walk. That's a long walk. But I'm showing his ability, and they all knew him at the bank there. He but was a he very, very small man, too. Very small. My size. But you say he couldn't do anything because it was tough when he first came to Dallas. Because, well, it was tough to. He didn't, couldn't, he just didn't do anything. He had some money. And somehow or the other, uh, it was the bank uh, wrote him or wired him. It was something in the futures. I don't even remember, but he lost all of his money. He was manipulating that money. That's so all. when you moved to Dallas, what happened? He didn't work. No. And Tonta did not work. Well, they had some money. But they had some money. money. And you and Auntie, Aunt Rosie, went out to work. Mm -hmm. And what did you do? I, was just, I worked for the... Uh, Oh, for the government. And you were, you took shorthand. Oh, yeah. And you typed. Mm -hmm. Tell them about how fast you typed. <laughs> Down at, uh, that's uh, one of their favorite stories. When I was in Bryan and worked at Texas A&M College, I worked, the architecture department was on the fourth floor of the main building. That's up and down, four flights of stairs and with no elevator. But anyway, I was typing one day these specifications for the architectural department, and a man walked in and put a bucket down next to me filled with water. And I said, what's that for? He said, well, you were typing so fast, I was afraid the typewriter would, it would get on fire. <laughs> <laughs> That's what, when I had my 90th birthday, Tracy, was it Tracy who wrote all of that up? Or uh, everybody wrote it. But it was put in there about the story of the typewriter nearly burning up. <laughs> and were you, uh, 
um, you were living at home all that time, and were you donate giving your money to your family? And, and, and when did you become a, a Sunday school teacher? Right soon after I came to Dallas. Janie's mother and her first husband lived next door to us on Forest Avenue, and the name was Rosenberg. And um, through them, I got acquainted with uh, John Rosen Rosenfield. That was an art critic at the Dallas News with his brother and wife. And she taught Sunday school in the kindergarten, and she got me to do it. And also, he he wrote articles. Jonas Rosenfield wrote articles. And I used to take a lot of drama and speech lessons. And he heard me one day. He, you know, those days, if you knew, if you could recite, you were always at parties, or if family came over, you were asked to get up and recite. Because we didn't have television or radio or anything like that. And he heard me one day and he said, I have a poem or a speech I want you to learn. And it was about the atrocities in the pogroms in Poland. And he coached me on that and had me give that at the Colonial Club. Was it about the Kishinev massacres, 1905? He had me give that. Do you remember any of it? No, I wish I had it too. It was, well, it was very dramatic. I don't know how the people at the club liked it or not, but, and through his wife, she got me to teach Sunday school. This is about 1915? No, we came here in 1919. That's Sorry. About 1920. And uh, then I taught Sunday school until Dad and I got married in 1925. Well, now, now just this, you, you said Poland, and I said Kishinev, which is Russia. But maybe that. But um, I, maybe you're right. Was it about current events, or was it about something that had happened 15 years ago? No, that was that had happened not too long before then in Poland, when they had the terrible pogroms there. They were just as bad, if not worse, than anything that had happened in Russia. Do you remember anything about the, the flu epidemic? Oh, yes. Uh, the, the one, and that was in Bryan. When we were living in Bryan, was that terrible flu epidemic. So many people died. What do you remember about it in particular? Did, did you take special precautions? No. Nobody. Never heard of it before. I know one Jewish man that died. Harry Marble was his name. In fact, that was a family, you know, what's his name? Uh, Sanger that just died, you know, uh, his wife, you know, was married to Dr. Krasnick at one time. Oh, yeah. Her, her family was the, and I tell you, the Marvel family was the, what's her name? Well, I'm thinking of She's a good friend of yours. Lawrence Block's wife. That was, that was a Marvel family, and it was a great uncle or something of her husband who died in the flu epidemic, that first flu epidemic. All I know is that all the many, many people that died. This so was about 1914? Mm -hmm. Before, just before World War I. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, See, that was when we lived in Brown, and we came here in 1919. Right. It, it, you know, we didn't ask anything, uh, any specific memories about World War I that you have, about people going off to war, or about well, what kind of things were done in Brian. I know I had a wonderful, lo lovely, very happy social life during that time. That's what you talked about because of the military base and that? Yeah, because boy, oh boy, it was wonderful. And we had the Jewish welfare headquarters at our home, as our house. They would come there. And, uh, and that's when I got to know really Jewish men. I what did Frida think about that? Did Frida think that was a good idea? The war? 
No, I mean about the setting up uh, uh, welfare at oh, board yes, at your she house was the one and entertaining. She and Dr. Townsend House were the ones we spoke of who did all of that. Now that raises another very important question: What did Frida think about the war? You know what? I I don't. We just took things for granted, I guess. I don't remember. I just because she had come from Germany. She was very Americanized. But uh, uh, what, and I remember, uh, we'd go down to the train and kiss all the boys goodbye, and they'd hang, with their hands hanging out of the window of the train, you know, as they were leaving. And I had a uh, young, young man, not Jewish, who tried to get me to marry him so I could get his widow's thing. <laughs> But I didn't. But my father always taught us that uh, date, you can't help but date non-Jewish boys, but don't ever marry them. Because he always said, I don't care how lovely they are, there is always a war. But things are different now. All of her children are married to non-Jews. <laughs> Tracy wasn't. Not yet. She it could very likely be. No, she's not. But her, but her Pauline's daughter-in-law is was not born Jewish, but she became Jewish and was not a. She knows more about Judaism than I do. You see, he said that's not an intermarriage. She didn't marry it. What? That's not an intermarriage. She converted. She converted. Right. Yeah, I, but Lisa is married. Lisa is married to him, and but he has really no religion. But I'm just saying, but in those days, oh, but when I got to Dallas, and uh, I know my sister and I dated, we belonged to Temple Emmanuel, and we dated two fellows from Sherrod, Israel, and boy, were we bought out. That was intermarriage. <laughs> okay, now it's time to talk. Now we're back in Dallas, and you wanted to talk before about the relations of uh, the Orthodox and the conservative and That's the Reform Jews. That's what I was Jews. talking about. Oh, goodness gracious, I can tell you the people that then belonged to Sherrod Israel. There was a rabbi at Sherrod Israel, and his name started with a W, and he would not come into the temple. Why? Because... It was too reformed. Did you go into Sherith Israel? Oh, I did. And what was Sherith Israel like in those days? Was it more traditional than it is today? Oh, much more. It was closer to orthodoxy. But it's entirely different. I am very happy to see what has happened. That the reformed temple and the Sherith Israel, now we didn't even think about the orthodox. Uh, but these two, which had nothing to do with each other, and now that it is so intermingled, I am tickled to death. I think it's one of the best things that ever happened to Jewish people. So you never went to Tiferet when you first came to Dallas? Did you know about it? Yes. There was an Orthodox, little Orthodox temple on Forest Avenue, uh, closer. The, uh, uh, away from the high school, in the other way. Anshe Sfarad? No. The Rumanische Shul? Not any of those. There's a, was a Gudasach in there. A Gudasach. Oh. That wasn't on Forest, that was on South Boulevard, wasn't it? No, that was on Forest. That'd be before. That'd be its first. Okay. I think. That was another one over there. But no, I just didn't know them. That I know of. Now, the. Selman family, you know, who are, well, they still are big at Charith Israel, aren't they? I don't know. Jake Feldman. Oh, yes, that's right. Well, they were big Charith Israel and in the Orthodox, too. F Fanny and what's her name? Uh, Shannon. That was. Go ahead. I don't know if it's. Con yeah. Uh -huh. But, oh, it's, it's such a, a 
are lingering now, uh, and I think it's wonderful. I always have thought it was wonderful, but it was terrible at that time. Did the uh, did the conservative uh, people and the reform people talk badly about each other? No, no, you just couldn't. And if you dared, if we as single girls dared to go with a non-Jew, we were almost uh, ostracized. From Emmanuel? Well, from the people, not not the temple itself, but the people, that young people. Did your Aunt Frida get along with uh, people at Emmanuel? Oh, yes. Were there a lot of people like her, a German people oh, yes. and lots very cultured? People. Yes, lots and lots and lots of people. Mm -hmm. uh, did she have a special relationship uh, with any of the rabbis there or with any of the leaders at Temple Emmanuel? Oh, uh, well, you see, Rabbi Lefkowitz came in after we did. In the 20s. Uh, while while, we were, while she was living, she got a very bad case of arthritis, and we went to uh, Mineral Wells for her to take the baths and things. And while there, we met a lot of rabbis, and they all liked her, and she liked all of them, and they had long discourses, and they wrote letters back and forth, you know. But she was a very cultured person. But no animosities at all. She was a very busy person, too. The type of person she was, was that she always said, I hope I'll never get so old that can't, I can't learn something from everybody. Tell about what kind of a household you had in, in Dallas and how people would come over from uh, Germany and gather. Oh, yes, and all the, all the so many of them, like, uh, I guess they... Edith Forshawn, you know, and a lot of the German Brook sailors. Brook sailors. They, we knew all of them when they first came to this country. Are you still friendly with Miss Brook Sailor? Yeah. I haven't seen her in a long time. She's had so many terrible problems. Well, she called when you were sick. She called she since I've been friends. sick. Yeah, we were um, very good friends. He was a wonderful baby doctor. Many people would come over, though, from Germany, and they would either live at this house on Forest Avenue or would gather there socially. They Were there any famous people that you remember? No. 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 Uh, I was just thinking of who else came over. There were so many of them, but I, that had died. Away. Where is, uh, do you have any of your Frida's correspondence, or do you know who has it? She wrote wonderful letters. Mainly in and German? In, no, in English. Both. I may, you know, it, it's terrible to say, but when I moved, we moved in this house. It was a month before my husband died, and he was very sick. And when we moved, being as he was sick, I moved a lot of things from our house on Woodland, where we lived for 29 or 30 years. I brought all of it. I've got stuff in this attic. God knows what is up well, there. The two, pitch, the two things up above you, the, the large that was plates. That was wedding present in Germany when her first marriage in Berlin, you know, when she lived in Berlin before we came there. I guess Auntie must have been about 20 when she got married. Mm -hmm. And those were, wedding, those were wedding presents. Let's break. Here we go. I love this part. We met because I was a Sunday school teacher at Temple Manual. And he was a Boy Scout master. That was it. <coughs> now, give me his full name. No, he did not like the name. His first name was Herman, mm -hmm. and he did not like the name. So he was always known as it was Herman 
Leonard Pierce. So he was always known as Lee. So I refer myself, and he always did it, as H. Lee Pierce. That's how anybody in Dallas would know him. H. Lee. And uh, talk about your uh, talk about um, your courtship. Um. Oh. Well, we courted for five years because he was in and out of Dallas. What was he doing? He first, when I first knew him, he was a rug salesman uh, with Santa Harris, and he was a specialist in Oriental rugs. And uh, he would, he was a very good conversationalist. He had a beautiful speaking voice. You know the kind of voice that Roosevelt had. That's the kind of a voice that he had, and he said that people can, he was he sold these rugs in Chicago first and then came here and every rug was supposed to the ancient old rugs to have a story and he'd make up these stories and, <laughs> and tell these stories. <laughs> so then we, he did various things until he got into something and I got a job as a secretary to an oil man. And uh who was that? Leon Russ was his name. And this was uh, in the early 20s? Well, we married in 1925 and uh, lived in Milwaukee for a year and came back to Dallas. And it was after that that I got into this, uh, got to work with him. And he managed to have a small oil company. And they had holdings mostly in West Texas. And he got my husband to go out to West Texas and try, and to East Texas, and try to buy leases. In other words, he got involved with this company. This was the first few years of the oil boom there, is that right? No. He, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're skipping a lot of stuff in here. I think you better drop this part. I'll tell you. This is a history, very long, involved part. His history of having been in the oil fields in the early days, which you'll find very interesting. Yeah, he was a roughneck in the oil fields. Um, uh, but uh, just after World War I? Uh-huh. Yeah. After World War I. After World War I. Okay. See, he was in World War I. He went in when he was about 18. Our son was in World War II. He went in just before he was 18, too, also. So, and then it was after the war that he gradually came, and that's a story of why he, I know why he came to Texas, but I'll tell that. Well, no, I think Dad, Daddy's story is a very involved story, and I already have a lot of it on tape. I see. So, I, I want you to go back to their courtship days, uh, because I think that it's more logical at this time. Okay. Talk about uh, how you would court and Daddy would go on the streetcar. Oh, you mean how he'd come to visit, because he didn't own a car, and he was. And we lived on Forest Avenue, and when he got to Irving Street, he had to change a streetcar and come down Forest Avenue, and the same going back. Well, my husband was a very husky, athletic man, built, large, had a large frame, as little frame as I had, he had a tremendous frame. So one evening, when he left my house, he got off of the streetcar at Forrest and Irving. And as he was getting on the streetcar to take him downtown where he lived, somewhere there, an automobile knocked him down and ran over him. And next day he came to see me and he said, I had an, I had an automobile run over me last night. I said, no, you couldn't. He said, I'll show you. And he took his shirt off, and there were tire marks across his chest. After they ran over, he got up and got on the streetcar. <laughs> <laughs> How long had you known him? How Is long had I known him then? Yeah. Oh, maybe three, four, five, six months. <laughs> <laughs> he was very powerful. <laughs> very powerful man. Uh, he was powerful. When did he do all of the traveling for, when he handled a line of clothes? Was that before you married? No, after we married. I said he tried to do a whole lot of things oh, after he stopped 
working for Santa Harris. And then he went out of town, he went somewhere else, and he came back. But it was before that, he was in the oil fields as a restaurant before I knew him. And he did lots and lots of things. He wrote, he wrote the, he rode the trains, the rails, the rails for a while. He did everything. He was raised in the Hebrew orphan home. Is that right? Oh, he's in New York. Fascinating story. And you have all that on tape. I believe so. Okay. From mother, from mother. Unfortunately, I didn't get him. Yeah, he, Doctor Lefkowitz. I don't be my taking that now. But my husband was raised in the Hebrew orphan home. He and the brother older than he. In those days, I don't know if it still is, if one parent was dead, the children were considered orphans. And he was there. And, uh, but uh, he had to wear his brother's. He always had bad feet because he had to wear his brother's shoes. But his mother died when he was in the service in World War I. And you, you uh, see, uh, I don't know what is on the tape now, but it tells the story then, and it's it's uh, quite a history. And he's the one whose father was a violinist in at uh, Franz Joseph's court. That was his father. And now my husband was born in New York, but his father was born, I think that was in Vienna. Why don't you give me the family names? Um, what well, the name is Pierce. Now, I don't, that was not the name then, and you might as well tell it. What, what the other name was? God. And that's a story as to why the name was changed. That are Guten Plan. Huh? Guten, Guten Plan. Plan. What, but don't, that, uh, that was the name, that was what his father's name was. And he was the first violinist at the first Waldorf Astoria in New York. No, he was the orchestra leader yeah, of the right. Waldorf Astoria. He that's was the court violinist for yeah. Franz Joseph. Franz Joseph. Of Austria. But he left after World War One, when Franz Joseph um, no, stepped no. down? Oh, no. Or this is before? Oh, no. he, that left, was he left at the turn of the century. My father was born in New York. I see. That's, no, that's this why. was his father was a violinist I see. and came to New York and was the first orchestra leader there. And uh, so my, he would die when my husband was four years old. This is all on, on this tape, because I have this down. Oh. It, it covers Dad's early life and how you all met and your business beginnings. And uh, I say something commented on mother and grandfather who was a dancer. Who was a dancer? No, that wasn't. That was a little of grandpa's. I don't know. That's my notes on that. On that. And 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 I'd like to. I have a lot of the stuff that had to do, which we never got into, of what Dad did in the in the West Texas oil fields. He had a lot to do with the development of the through the business that he had. So that's and I've got I've got those. I've got pictures and letters and magazine articles about him. That'll help you. Yes, we really, really do. That's that is another we thing. We can set a date, you know, in about a month. When, when, when Pauline is over her operation sufficiently, I want her to be in here because it's hard for me to remember all those things. And you're wonderful to work with. I just wish that Leonard had been here today because he could have asked, added a lot of things too. But he was out taking pictures today. Uh, well, then we'll we'll continue this. Um, we're now we're down to the uh, end uh, of the tape. Would you would you like to leave uh, you know any last message on the tape before we call it a day? I think I think I've talked enough. Don't you? <laughs> no, I don't think so. You Regina. want to know all about Pauline as she grew? Up? Oh, we'll get there. No. We'll get there. <laughs> No, you're about you, to, you know about her accomplishments. Mother, okay. you're about to celebrate your 95th birthday. Mm -hmm. And you know the story of my family was going to give. And furthermore, you know she was born on my birthday. 
Really? Um, she has a birthday the same day. Her youngest daughter, who has a child, was ordered for the same day, but she came four days, three early, days, three days early. And I, I always say the reason she came three days early is because she figured it was time because she weighed ten pounds and how much? Five. Pounds. Five ounces when she was born. And now Lisa, do you know Lisa? Lisa's going to have a baby around the same time, between October the 19th and the 25th or something like that. So, God willing, we will have a party for you to celebrate your birthday, whether it's exactly on your birthday or not. We I know we will, but we can't have it in October because she will be having hers about the same time. And isn't that interesting? Me and a daughter and two granddaughters who will also be in October. I think it's... Telling stories about you for a long time, Rosita. <laughs>